Well, hello, my friends. My name is Nick, and today we're gonna fire back up the Houseplant Exhibition Series. I started this a while back. I never exactly stuck with it, but I really enjoyed it. So I'm really excited to get back into it today. For these exhibitions, there are six categories that we go over. So there's the thriller, the filler, the spiller, the drama, the diva, and the underdog. The thriller, filler, and spiller pull from classic plant display and window box rules, while the drama, the diva, and the underdog are kind of a little bit more up to my interpretation. I really don't need these glasses today. They're mostly for the thumbnail. They barely have a prescription. Kicking things off with a thriller or a plant that truly commands attention in the home, I wanted to spotlight one of the plants that I think truly has the largest impact on my home aesthetically, and that's my staghorn fern. This thing has a lot of character by itself, but it's put even more over the top by the way that I have it displayed here in my home on my walls. All I did was tie this fern to this piece of wood with some fishing line. You can see it all on the back here, and that's how this plant lives, and that's how I have this plant displayed. It was easy as that. And this thing doesn't even look like a fern, which makes it even more exciting in my opinion. Whenever someone new comes over my house and they ask me about it, which every single person does because it's a freaking plant living and growing on my wall, whenever I tell them it's a fern, they <laughs> never believe me and I'm just like, trust. It is. The question I always receive most often about this plant is how do I care for it? To water it, I simply just throw it in the shower with all of my other mounted plants. Like once a week, I'd say like every seven to 10 days, once I can physically feel that the moss is dry, I give it a good soak, I let them all dry out, and then I hang them back up once they're safe to put back up on my wall. The lighting, however, I think is a little bit more important to consider because this is like a piece of art. We might want to treat it as such and just hang it up anywhere on the wall, just like we would put a piece of of art where it's gonna look best aesthetically. But plants like this staghorn fern require decently bright light to grow to their fullest potential. I failed a lot with staghorn ferns when I first got into indoor gardening because I would just put them somewhere where it looked nice. It was never receiving enough light and they would always die within a couple of months or just slowly wither away. But this one I had next to a bright window in my last apartment and here in my current home, I have this one right underneath my skylight in my kitchen. So this is receiving some really good light. You can tell how happy and healthy this one is by all the large leaves and how how robust these shields are. They will start out green, but they will turn brown. You don't want to remove them when they turn brown. It's how the plant is going to hold on to this moss or whatever potted medium that you're using. It's how they grab onto and hold onto trees in nature. Most other ferns and any other epiphytic house plant can be mounted and displayed just like this staghorn fern, but no other plant makes quite the impact that the staghorn fern does, just in my opinion. The filler plant or a plant that kind of just exists without grabbing too much attention, but still makes an impact on the home. That I wanted to talk about today is one of my favorite air plants, the Tillandsia tectorum. Air plants overall are filler plants. I really love using them to fill in the gaps anywhere that I can in my home where a plant would just look perfect, whether it's as basic as on a plant shelf like the one that I have behind me, or as creative as displaying them on wall baskets if you use wall baskets to decorate the walls in your home. Listen, I'm perfectly aware that air plants are not the most popular plants out there, but I love them, so frankly, you should too. I just really love this Tectorum because it has a lot of character. Even as just a filler plant, this plant has a lot to offer. It's interesting enough to stand out amongst other air plants, but it's not going to distract and grab attention from any potted plants. Just like mounted plants, however, I do think the care for air plants is widely misunderstood because they just exist and don't have a pot or any soil. When I used to work at the plant store, I'd always hear people say, get an air plant because it doesn't need any land, it doesn't need any water, and they couldn't be more wrong about that. Depending on the air plant, your air plants are going to require good watering at least once every week or so. And the lighting is even more important, just like with mounted plants, we can forget that these plants actually do require light to photosynthesize. The rule of thumb that I use is that if your air plant is a little bit more on the greener side, like a deeper green foliage, that can probably withstand some medium to lower light. But if it's got some silver or whiter foliage, just like this Tillandsia tectorum, it's gonna require some bright direct sunlight to grow to its fullest potential because that's what it's receiving in its natural habitat. If you've struggled with growing air plants in the past, it's pretty simple. You're probably just not caring for them correctly, and that's okay. We all have to learn ourselves. Or maybe you just got some wildly false information from your friends. That's okay too. So for a spiller or a trailing plant, always a favorite, I wanted to talk about the Hoya curtisii today. Curtisi? I'm not really sure. I've always heard that you double pronounce the double I in plant Latin, so curtisii, but then I've always heard hardcore Hoya collectors say curtisi. But then again, I 
I'm not totally convinced they're right. It really doesn't matter. Regardless, this plant is an absolute powerhouse of a trailing plant. It gives a very similar vibe to the string of hearts, but I kind of prefer the leaf shape. The little dainty pointed leaves I think are absolutely adorable and they sun stress beautifully. In my brain, they get this sort of reverse mint chocolate chip appearance with the dark brown leaves and the bright green speckling. It's totally adorable. It's so cute. I love it. I attempted and failed growing this Hoya a couple times in the past. It wasn't until I hung this up in a bright east facing window where this plant started to grow exponentially for me. Now it's literally covered and crawling in new growth. I've never seen this sold or marketed as a shingling Hoya, like one that would be sold on a wood plank with the leaves flat up against it. But this thing really enjoys growing up against my the planter here and just lying up flat against it and the roots will root into the planter and then it's even worked its way into the drainage hole down the bottom. I don't really know what I'm gonna do about that. It's not that big of a deal. It has bloomed for me a couple times. Unfortunately, there's no flowers on this plant right now and I don't think I have any footage of it, but the white flowers do really stand out on this plant incredibly. The only thing I'm not obsessed with aesthetically about this plant is the plethora of aerial roots. <laughs> They're coming off every inch of this plant and it can be a little distracting on some of the vines that still haven't produced leaves, kind of giving it like a centipede appearance. So not obsessed with that, but let's just chalk that up to character. Wink. Once upon a time, this plant was not the easiest Hoya to get your hands on, but nowadays you can probably walk into practically any houseplant store and find it for a decently low price. And we love that. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the drama. How is my pits doing? I think they're looking exactly as expected. So for the drama today, or a plant that really has something interesting or dramatic to offer aesthetically, I wanted to talk about the ever so lovely Starfish Sansevieria. This plant is never gonna get exponentially large and it's never gonna be classified as a thriller plant, but its niche, unique shape, I think really puts it over the edge. The main issue I have with this plant is that its wingspan and its overall succulence makes it a little difficult to place it in the plant displays or have it on a window. You really have to get it in there at the right angle, but that is such a small qualm to have. So if that's the worst issue I have, that's pretty good. No pest problems here, I can tell you that. With plants like this, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is to water them because we're not gonna be watering them every week like we will be most of our other plants. We can easily forget the last time we watered it and suddenly it might be two, three, four weeks before we realize we haven't watered this plant in a long time. In extended periods of drought, these super succulent stalk-like leaves can get kind of shriveled and sad looking and it will take some time for them to recover and plump back up. It's not just gonna happen immediately upon the first watering. Snake plants are often said to be low light plants. Spoiler alert, they're not. This super succulent starfish sansevieria is going to require even more bright direct light than a standard snake plant would. And if this was subject to too low of light, these thick stalks are going to grow in pinky thin and we don't want that. Once a leaf on a snake plant grows in, it's not going to magically grow larger if it's subject to higher light. However it grows in is the way it's going to look forever. So you're going to want to make sure you give this plant the best light you possibly can to keep it looking its best. We don't want pencil thin plants. We want happy, healthy plants. Other varieties of snake plant can be grown near a bright window, but this starfish sansevieria has to be grown in a bright window sill. Trust. The diva, or a plant that behaves as such that I can't necessarily recommend in good faith, is going to be the Anthurium Fingers today. I had high hopes for this plant. I've actually had this exact plant right here for about four years at this point, but it definitely doesn't look like it. At one point, this did have multiple fully developed beautiful leaves on the plant, but it's been a pretty long time since I've personally seen them. I've had this one growing underneath a grow light, inside a greenhouse, inside a greenhouse cabinet with a grow light. Everything you're supposed to do for Anthurium for them to grow successfully in your home. I've tried with this and it's just not working for me. And this isn't even supposed to be one of the difficult anthuriums. Just like my falling out that I'm experiencing with philodendrons, I think I'm also feeling it currently with anthuriums. All of my fancier anthuriums have come and gone at this point. I still have one that I'm holding on to, but it looks basically just like my anthurium fingers here, except worse. Feel free to leave some tips in the comments for others. I think I'm personally done with this genus at this point. I just don't have the time and money to waste on any plants that aren't going to make an impact on my home whatsoever. And finally, let's talk about the underdog or a plant that deserves way more attention than it actually receives. And that's going to be the false Aurelia today. I know I've talked about this plant a couple of times in the past couple of months since I've brought it into my home, but it really is such an incredible house plant. As small specimens, they really aren't anything special. It's not until they grow up to be large 
large trees or floor plants where their potential is truly unlocked and their character develops. False Aurelias are in the same family as Schifleras, the Aurelia family, believe it or not. And they have the same digitate or umbrella-like leaves. While Schifleras leaves are green and rounded, the False Aurelia has dark, jagged leaves. And as those leaves grow larger and the plant matures, that's when this plant is going to make much more of an impact. Combined with their funky wooden trunks, this plant is a plant styling powerhouse. And like I said, this small plant isn't going to do it any justice today, but a quick Google search can change that. Really, the main downfall with this plant is that you can't usually purchase it with all of that character that I'm boasting about today. It's something you're going to have to look forward to and grow towards. Although not always, if you are going to buy a large specimen of this plant at a nursery in a 10 inch pot or a two gallon pot, what have it, it's still probably going to be a low lying bush, which means it's probably going to be years until this plant truly unlocks its full potential. Miracles can happen, but I'm not expecting this one right here to be anything special for probably about five years at this point. But I'm pretty patient, so it's fine. I do have this one sitting underneath one of my Soltec lights, so in the meantime, it's at least encouraging it to grow pretty fast. While I wait, I get to experience the joy of watching this plant grow one leaf at a time, each leaf growing slightly more mature than the last. But that's going to do it for today's houseplant exhibition. Today's plants were all decently common houseplants, so hopefully this allowed you to see some of those in a different light. I know I always find myself interested in plants that at one point in my life I had zero interest in, and that really helps keep things exciting. For me, if you were doing a houseplant exhibition, what plants would you pick? Let me know in the comments. I'd really love to hear. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you don't already, you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Philly Foliage. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and I will see you guys in my next video. Have a great day.